Hello. Before we get started, I want to wish every mother out there a happy Mother's Day. Doesn't matter if you have a human baby or a fur baby, you're still a mother. So happy Mother's Day to you, and I hope your day will be full of God's blessings. Let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you, and we thank you for the day you've given us, Lord. I'm thankful for the people that are watching. Father, I pray that as we look at your word that you will speak to us. Father, open up our hearts, our minds. Father, just let your, your words make an impact upon our hearts. Father, we'll ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We'll be reading from 1 Chronicles chapter 19, 1 Chronicles chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. 1 Chronicles chapter 19, we'll begin reading in verse number 1. And it says, Now it came to pass after this that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, died, and his son reigned in his stead. And David said, I will show kindness unto Hanan, the son of Nahash, because his father showed kindness to me. And David sent messengers to comfort him concerning his father. So the servants of David came into the land of the children of Ammon to Hanan to comfort him. But the princes of the children of Ammon said to Hanan, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father, that he hath sent comforters unto thee? Are not his servants come unto thee for to search, and to overthrow, and to spy out the land? Wherefore Hanan took David's servants, and shaved them, and cut off their garments in the midst hard by their buttocks, and sent them away. And there, then there went certain, and told David how the men were served, and he sent to meet them, for the, man, for the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, Tarry at Jericho until your beards be grown and then return. Here you have David, the king of Israel, a righteous king, a ruler that has done what God has asked of him, overtaking hostile rulers when part of the thing of them uh, ruling the promised land was that they had to go in and those that were hostile to them, they had to overtake them. And that's what exactly David had done. He had overtaken the hostile ruler, rulers while showing kindness to the non-hostile rulers. And in this passage, David wanting to show kindness and compassion is very misunderstood. And the person who he shows that compassion to misreads it, and because of it, things get very heated. Very similar to the times that Christians show compassion to people by sharing their faith, and people misread that compassion for something else. So as we look at this passage right now, let us think of our faith and the compassion involved in sharing it. The first thing that I want you to see from this passage is that King David saw an opportunity to show kindness and compassion. In verses 1 and 2 again, it says, Now it came to pass after this that Nahash the king of the children of Naaman had died, and his son reigned in his stead. And David said, I will show kindness unto Hanan the son of Nahash. Now, this man had just lost his father. And so David heard of it and he said, you know, I'm going to send somebody to him to show them that I'm thinking about them, to show them that I, I have compassion and I want to show my kindness unto him. Nahash, the king of Ammon, has died. And now Hanan, his son, has become the ruler. Now, somewhere along the way, Nahash had shown kindness and compassion to David. The Bible doesn't say how uh, Nahash has shown compassion to David, but somewhere along the way he did. We don't know what he did. Maybe when David was being sought by Saul, the then king of Israel. But we are not given specific, just that he showed David kindness somewhere along the way. And because of Nahash's death, David knew that death could be hard, and he wanted to show his son kindness and compassion. See, hopefully if you are watching this, you already know or you're about to find out that there is somebody that showed all of mankind a huge act of compassion and kindness. Uh, if you'll keep your finger marked there in First Chronicles, go with me to the book of Romans. New Testament, the book of Romans chapter 5. And we'll begin reading in verse number 8. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse number 8. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. 
Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned over the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as if it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by one the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteousness. See, the thing about it is that God the Father saw an opportunity to show us love, kindness, and compassion. And when he saw the opportunity, he took it. This gift that we just read about in this passage, the gift was and still is an act of compassion. God sent his son to atone for our sins by dying upon the cross. God saw a way to show us salvation, which is compassion, and he did it. It was not easy for him to allow his only begotten son to to be taken to a, a horrible thing such as the cross and to be killed upon it just so that he could atone for your sins and mine. That's compassion. He let his son go through that for us. We see people struggling. We see them frustrated. We see them hurting. We see them discouraged. And we see the opportunity to show compassion and kindness by sharing our faith. But will we take that opportunity? We see it, it's before us. We know they're hurting, especially during this time when we're still worrying about this coronavirus. We're still worrying about people's health. We're still worrying that, that somebody's going to contract it and die. And we see the, the people still being frightened by all of this. Maybe it's time that we share with them the one that has everything in control. Maybe it's time they hear about the compassion of our Heavenly Father. So first of all, I want you to see from this passage, going back to 1 Chronicles chapter 19 now. First thing I want you to see was that King David saw an opportunity to show kindness and compassion. See, King Nahash, the king of of Ammon, had died and now his son, uh, Hanan, was going to take over for him. and, And David wanted to show him compassion. Second thing I want you to see from this passage is that David's act of compassion and kindness was misunderstood. Verse 3, still in First Chronicles chapter 19, look at verse 3. It says, But the princes of the children of Ammon said to Hanan, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father, that he hath sent comforters unto thee? Are not his servants come unto thee for to search and to overthrow and to spy out the land? See, here his advisors were, and, and they had every right to be leery. Because the the king had just passed away, a new ruler was coming on the scene, and many times uh, rulers of other nations will look at that as a time of vulnerability. Oh, a new ruler really doesn't know what's going on. We can march in there, we can overtake it, and we can have it as our own. And so they were very leery. But when David sent his men, and the men weren't showing any kind of hostile act, because if truly if David wanted to overtake it, he would have sent his army in there. But he sent some men. He sent some men to go in there to show compassion and kindness. See, his King Hanan advisors thought that he was there to search, to overthrow, and to spy out the land. And looking back now, you see that they blew it. It could have been a way to continue the friendship between David and the ruler of Ammon, but they blew it. They blew it because what they did, they took those men and they humiliated them. They shaved their beard. Back then, a beard was a sign of, of respect. It was a sign that, you know, they had let it grow. And it was their choice to have it grown. And then when they were shaved, they were disrespected. 
But even their clothing, it says that they, they, they cut their clothings. And, and, and it was just an, a big act of, of humiliation for these men. Sometimes people will misunderstand our desire to share our faith with them. A genuine Christian is so filled with God's grace, his love, his mercy, his compassion, and caring that we can't help but want others to have it also. You know, so many times people think we want to share our faith because we're holy rollers and we, we want to seem holier than thou. But truly, a genuine Christian that is wanting to share their faith is so overwhelmed by what God has done for them that they simply just want other people to have it in their lives also. Finger mark there in 1 Chronicles. Go with me to the New Testament again, Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. In Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. In Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1, and it says, And this is the account of, of Saul, who later becomes Paul, his conversion. It says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. And desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of his way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto them, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And as the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man, and Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the streets, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayed. And he had seen a vision, a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And there he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. See, Ananias, he was told to go to the Saul whom he had already heard about because Saul was the one that was persecuting the church of Jesus Christ. He was there trying to get anybody that tried to proclaim that, that Jesus was Lord and, and Ananias was told by the Lord himself, said, look, I want you to go to this Paul. I want you to go to Saul, who will later become Paul. And he says, I want you to lay your hands on him. And Ananias was like, whoa, hold up, God. Hey, I've heard what he's done. And if I go there, he has the power to lock me up and put me into prison. And you know what? The thing about it is that Ananias first doubted the true conversion of Saul. And many times that when we try to share our faith with people we know, they will tend to doubt us. They may doubt us because of our past. They may doubt our faith because of other Christians' actions that have let them down, so-called Christians. They may doubt us because of their failures and disbelief in change that a person can truly change for the better. And so many times when a person will set out and they'll try to share their faith, their families will have doubt because they don't know if it's real or not. But we should never stop showing compassion. Even if people doubt our, our true change, our true conversion to a Christian, even if people doubt our past, even if people doubt the, the hurt because of the hurt that other Christians may have bestowed upon them, it should never keep us from attempting to show compassion and kindness to somebody by showing them the way to Jesus Christ. You look at David. He was a king. He was a powerful king. And back then he was the most powerful king. But he saw an opportunity to show kindness and compassion. His act of compassion and kindness was misunderstood but it didn't change who he was. He was still a follower of God. But the third and last thing I want to share with you out of this passage, going back to 1 Chronicles now. 1 Chronicles 
chapter 19. Third thing I want to share with you is that Hanan's and Ammon's refusal to David's compassion brought with it wrath. First Chronicles chapter 19, look at verse 6. It says, And when the children of Ammon saw that they had made themselves odious to David, knowing that they had really upset David, Hanan and the children of Ammon sent a thousand talents of silver to hire them chariots and horsemen out of Mesopotamia and out of Syria, Maka, and out of Zobah. And they hired 30 and 2,000 chariots and the king of Mecca and his people who came and pitched before Mediba and the children of Ammon gathered themselves together from their cities and came to battle. So here they were. They had blown it. They had disrespected uh, King David and his men. And so they knew that they had probably upset him. And so what they did, instead of trying to hurry up and say, hey, David, we're sorry, we we doubted what you were doing, but we want to say we apologize, forgive us. No, they went and hired an outside army to come and defend them against David. And picking up in verse 8, it says, And when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the host of the mighty men. And the children of Ammon came out and put the battle in array before the gate of the city. And the kings that were come were by themselves in the field. Now when Joab saw the battle was set against them before and behind, he chose out all the choice of Israel and put them in array against the Syrians. Little did they know that the, the children of Ammon, by what they had done, by what King Hanan had done, by disrespecting uh, David's uh, compassion and his kindness, they were going to bring upon themselves wrath. And it wasn't David's wrath, it was God's wrath. See, Hanan of Ammon hired the Syrians to help them fight against David and Israel. And the army of Israel would defeat the armies of Ammon and Syria. You drop down to verse 18, you'll find out with the Syrian army, uh, 7,000 and then another 40,000 men were killed. 47,000 men were killed because of King Hanan's disrespect unto David's compassion. And then look at verse 19. Not only did they lose all those men, but it says, And when the servants of Hadarezer saw that they were put to the worst before Israel, they made peace with David and became his servants. Neither would the Syrians help the children of Ammon any more. Not only did they lose 47,000 men, but they became the servants of Israel. But you look at the children of Ammon, the people of Ammon fled to their city and would have to worry about Israel and David from then on for their treacherous behavior, behavior toward David and all of Israel. See, their refusal to David's compassion brought with it great wrath. Lives were lost. Security was lost. Kindness was lost. The, the treaty between uh, Ammon and Israel would be broken, and now they would have to worry for the rest of their lives about what they had done. You say, Brother King, why is that such a big deal? Because if people only knew the refusal of God's compassion, Jesus Christ brings with it eternal wrath. Brings with it eternal wrath. Uh, still in the Old Testament, go to the book of Nahum. The book of Nahum. Right before the book of Habakkuk is the book of Nahum. Look at chapter 1, verse number 3. Nahum chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, it says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. See, God is not able to acquit the wicked. He's not able to overlook the sinner. He's not able to overlook the transgressions that have been committed against him. And so understand this, that sooner or later, a person will have to account for their transgression against God. But the wonderful thing about God our Father is that he saw the opportunity, man's sin, to show us compassion by giving his son, Jesus Christ, to atone for our sins, not his sins. The Bible says that Jesus was perfect in every way, tempted such as we are, yet he was without sin. So when he went to the cross, he didn't atone for his sins. He atoned for every human sins. Then going to the New Testament now, go to the book of 1 Thessalonians. The book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 
the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, look at verses 9 and 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, look at verses 9 and 10. And it says, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. See, understanding the wrath to come, that's talking about hell. Hell is God's wrath upon people who reject Jesus Christ. If you're, you're watching this video right now, understand this, that God loves us so much that he had great compassion, great love upon us, that he said, you know what, I'll send my son to die in their stead. Because we are the ones that deserve to die upon the cross. But he said, I'll allow my son to do it because I'm going to show them compassion and I'm going to, I'm going to show them love. Because he saved us from the wrath to come. And then one more time, still in the book of First Thess Thessalonians, go to chapter 5, verse 9. The book of First Thessalonians, chapter 5, look at verse number 9. It says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. See, the Bible tells us right then and there that God wants no one to go to hell. He's not appointed us to wrath, but to attain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, Brother Kenny, how do I attain this salvation? If, if I don't want to die and go to hell, how can I obtain this salvation of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ? See, what you have to do is, first of all, realize we're all sinners. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not one human being walking this earth today that is without sin. We're all sinners. Second thing is you have to believe. Believe that Jesus Christ truly came to this earth with a mission. To die for our sins. He lived 33 years just to be without sin so that when they offered him upon the cross, he is the one that would be able to pay the price for our sins. See, God established a price for sin. He said there has to be a shedding of blood for the remission of sins. And that's exactly what Christ did. He shed his blood upon the cross to have our sins taken away. You have to believe that's what Jesus did. The third thing, you have to confess your sins. Say, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've sinned. I know that I've done wrong. I know that because of my sin, I'm bound for a place called hell, the place of wrath. But Jesus, I want to ask you to my life. I want to ask you to come into my life, forgive me of my sins. And the Bible says that if you'll do that, you'll be saved. Saved from what? Saved from wrath in hell. You'll be given heaven as your home. You look at this account of David and you say, well, David was misunderstood, big deal. I think that there's a lot of great Christians out there trying to share their faith that are misunderstood all the time. People think something uh, less of their, their being genuine about sharing their faith with them. Hey, we've been offered something amazing. We've taken hold of that something amazing through Jesus Christ. And we merely just want other people to have the same opportunity. David saw an opportunity to show compassion, and he did it. We see the opportunity. Man, we're primed right now. You're living here on this earth with every chaotic thing that's going on right now. God is priming us, priming the situation for us to see where compassion can be given. And he expects us to show that compassion, take that opportunity to seize it. But secondly, David's act of compassion and kindness was misunderstood. Even though he was misunderstood, it wouldn't keep David from still being a compassionate king, a compassionate person when the need arose. And we look around, and even though we may be misunderstood at times, our faith may be doubted, don't ever let that stop you from showing compassion by sharing your faith with people that are truly in need of it. But lastly, Hanan's and Ammon's refusal to David's compassion brought with it wrath. If we can make people understand that if they don't have Christ in their life, all they have to look forward to is wrath. Let us make sure that we're willing to do what God wants us to do. Share with people that if they refuse it, they have nothing to look forward to but eternal wrath and hell.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for this time. Thank you again for the opportunity to open your word. And Father, I pray that as people listen to this, that Lord, it will rest heavy upon our hearts, upon our minds. Father, may we be thinking how everything that's going on in the world to do today, let it fuel us to do something even more amazing for you. Father, I pray that when the church houses reopen, that when people come in, that we will be more energized, we will be more focused than ever before. Father, set our hearts of fire for you. Father, I pray that there will be fruit from your word read. And Father, may it fall upon the hearts that need it. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.